I feel it my duty to say this in order to crush the arrogance of men who are themselves at the mercy of fortune, and to claim the right of bestowing a benefit for slaves in order that I may claim it also for sons. The question arises whether children can ever bestow upon their parents greater benefits than those which they have received from them. It is granted that many sons become greater and more powerful than their parents, and also that they are better men. If this be true, they may give better gifts to their fathers than they have received from them, seeing that their fortune and their good nature are alike greater than that of their father. Whatever a father receives from his son, our opponents will urge, must in any case be less than what the son received from him, because the son owes to his father the very power of giving. Therefore, the father can never be surpassed in the bestowal of benefits, because the benefit which surpasses his own is really his. I answer that some things derive their first origin from others, yet are greater than those others. And a thing may be greater than that from which it took its rise, although without that thing to start from it never could have grown so great. All things greatly outgrow their beginnings. Seeds are the causes of all things, and yet are the smallest part of the things which they produce. Look at the Rhine, or the Euphrates, or any other famous rivers. How small they are if you only view them at the place from whence they take their rise. They gain all that makes them terrible and renowned as they flow along. Look at the trees which are tallest if you consider their height, and the broadest if you look at the thickness and the spread of their branches. Compared with all this, how small a part of them is contained in the slender fibers of the root? Yet take away the roots, and no more groves will arise, nor great mountains be clothed with trees. Temples and cities are supported by their foundations, yet what is built as the foundation of the entire building lies out of sight. So it is in other matters. The subsequent greatness of a thing ever eclipses its origin. I could never have obtained anything without having previously received the boon of existence from my parents. Yet it does not follow from this that whatever I obtain is less than that without which I could not obtain it. If my nurse had not fed me when I was a child, I should not have been able to conduct any of those enterprises which I now carry on, both with my head and with my hand, nor should I ever have obtained the fame which is due to my labours both in peace and war. Would you on that account argue that the services of a nurse were more valuable than the most important undertakings? Yet is not the nurse as important as the father, since without the benefits which I have received from each of them alike, I should have been alike unable to effect anything? If I owe all that I now can do to my original beginning, I cannot regard my father or my grandfather as being their original beginning. There always will be a spring further back from which the spring next below is derived. Yet no one will argue that I owe more to unknown and forgotten ancestors than to my father, though really I do owe them more, if I owe it to my ancestors that my father begat me. Chapter 30 Whatever I have bestowed upon my father, says my opponent, however great it may be, yet is less valuable than what my father has bestowed upon me, because if he had not begotten me, it never could have existed at all. By this mode of reasoning, if a man healed my father when ill and at the point of death, I shall not be able to bestow anything upon him equivalent to what I have received from him. For had my father not been healed, he could not have begotten me. Yet think whether it be not nearer the truth to regard all that I can do and all that I have done as mine due to my own powers and my own will. Consider what the fact of my birth is in itself. You will see that it is a small matter, the outcome of which is dubious, and that it may lead equally to good or to evil. No doubt it is the first step to everything, but because it is first, it is not on that account more important than all the others. Suppose that I have saved my father's life, raised him to the highest honours, and made him the chief man in his city, that I have not merely made him illustrious by my own deeds, but have furnished him himself with an opportunity of performing great exploits, which is at once important, easy, and safe, as well as glorious, that I have loaded him with appointments, wealth, and all that attracts men's minds. Still, even when I surpassed all others, I am inferior to him. 
Now if you say you owe to your father the power of doing all this, I shall answer. Quite true, if to do all this is only necessary to be born. But if life is merely an unimportant factor in the art of living well, and if you have bestowed upon me only that which I have in common with wild beasts and the smallest, and some of the foulest of creatures, do not claim for yourself what did not come into being as a consequence of the benefits which you bestowed, even though it could not have come into being without them. Chapter 31 Suppose, father, that I have saved your life in return for the life which I received from you. In this case, also I have outdone your benefit, because I have given life to one who understands what I have done, and because I understood what I was doing, since I gave you your life not for the sake of, or by the means of my own pleasure. For just as it is less terrible to die before one has time to fear death, so it is a much greater boon to preserve one's life than to receive it. I have given life to one who will at once enjoy it. You gave it to one who knew not if he should ever live. I have given life to one who was in fear of death. Your gift of life merely enables me to die. I have given you a life complete, perfect. You begat me without intelligence, a burden upon others. Do you wish to know how far from a benefit it was to give life under such conditions? You should have exposed me as a child, for you did me a wrong in begetting me. What do I gather from this? That the cohabitation of a father and a mother is the very least of benefits to their child, unless in addition this beginning of kindnesses be followed up by others and confirmed by other services. It is not a good thing to live, but to live well. But, say you, I do live well. True, but I might have lived ill. So that your part in me is merely this, that I live. If you claim merit to yourself for giving me mere life, bare and helpless, and boast of it as a great boon, reflect that this you claim merit for giving me is a boon which I possess in common with flies and worms. In the next place, if I say no more than that I have applied myself to honorable pursuits, and have guided the course of my life along the path of rectitude, then you have received more from your benefit than you gave. For you gave me to myself, ignorant and unlearned, and I have returned to you a son such as you would wish to have begotten. Chapter 32 My father supported me. If I repay this kindness, I give him more than I received, because he has the pleasure, not only of being supported, but of being supported by a son, and receives more delight from my filial devotion than from food itself, whereas the food which he used to give me merely affected my body. What, if any man rises so high as to become famous among nations for his eloquence, his justice, or his military skill, if much of the splendor of his renown is shed upon his father also, and by its clear light dispels the obscurity of his birth, does not such a man confer an inestimable benefit upon his parents? Would anyone have heard of Aristo and Gryllus except through Xenophon and Plato, their sons? Socrates kept alive the memory of Sophroniscus. It would take long to recount the other men whose names survive for no other reason than that the admirable qualities of their sons have handed them down to posterity. Did the father of Marcus Agrippa, of whom nothing was known, even after Agrippa became famous, confer the greater benefit upon his son, or was that greater which Agrippa conferred upon his father when he gained the glory, unique in the annals of war of a naval crown, and when he raised so many vast buildings in Rome, which not only surpassed all former grandeur, but have been surpassed by none since? Did Octavius confer a greater benefit upon his son, or the Emperor Augustus upon his father? obscured as he was by the intervention of an adoptive father? What joy would he have experienced if, after the putting down of the civil war, he had seen his son ruling the state in peace and security? He would not have recognized the good which he himself bestowed, and would hardly have believed, when he looked back upon himself, that so great a man could have been born in his house. Why should I go on to speak of others who would now be forgotten if the glory of their sons had not raised them from obscurity and kept them in the light until this day? In the next place, 
as we are not considering what son may have given back to his father greater benefits than he received from him. But whether a son can give back greater benefits, even if the examples which I have quoted are not sufficient, and such benefits do not outweigh the benefits bestowed by the parents, if no age has produced an actual example, still it is not in the nature of things impossible. Though no solitary act can outweigh the deserts of a parent, yet many such acts combined by one son may do so. Chapter 33 Scipio, while under seventeen years of age, rode among the enemy in battle and saved his father's life. Was it not enough that in order to reach his father, he despised so many dangers when they were pressing hardest upon the greatest generals, that he, a novice in his first battle, made his way through so many obstacles, over the bodies of so many veteran soldiers, and showed strength and courage beyond his years? Add to this that he also defended his father in court, and saved him from a plot of his powerful enemies, that he heaped upon him a second and a third consulship, and other posts which were coveted even by consulars, that when his father was poor, he bestowed upon him the plunder which he took by military license, and that he made him rich with the spoils of the enemy, which is the greatest honor of a soldier. If even this did not repay his debt, Add to it that he caused him to be constantly employed in the government of provinces and in special commands. Add that after he had destroyed the greatest cities, and became without a rival either in the east or in the west, the acknowledged protector and second founder of the Roman Empire, he bestowed upon one who was already of noble birth the higher title of the father of Scipio. Can we doubt that the commonplace benefit of his birth was outdone by his exemplary conduct, and by the valour which was at once the glory and the protection of his country? Next, if this be not enough, suppose that a son were to rescue his father from the torture, or to undergo it in his stead. You can suppose the benefits returned by the son as great as you please, whereas the gifts he received from his father was of one sort only, was easily performed, and was a pleasure to the giver, that he must necessarily have given the same thing to many others, even to some to whom he knows not that he has given it, that he had a partner in doing so, and that he had in the view of the law, patriotism, the rewards bestowed upon fathers of families by the state, the maintenance of his house and family, everything rather than him to whom he was giving life. What? Supposing that any one were to learn philosophy and teach it to his father, could it be any longer disputed that the son had given him something greater than he had received from him, having returned to his father a happy life, whereas he had received from him merely life? Chapter 34 But, says our opponent, whatever you do, whatever you are able to give to your father is part of the benefit bestowed upon you. So it is the benefit of my teacher that I have become proficient in liberal studies. Yet we pass on from those who taught them to us, at any rate from those who taught us the alphabet. And although no one can learn anything without them, yet it does not follow that whatsoever success subsequently obtains, one is still inferior to those teachers. There is a great difference between the beginning of a thing and its final development. The beginning is not equal to the thing at its greatest, merely upon the ground that without the beginning it could never have become so great. Chapter 35 It is now time for me to bring forth something, so to speak, from my own mint. So long as there is something better than the benefit which a man bestows, he may be outdone. A father gives life to his son, there is something better than life. Therefore, a father may be outdone, because there is something better than the benefit which he has bestowed. Still further, he who has given any one his life, if he be more than once saved from peril of death by him, has received a greater benefit than he bestowed. Now a father has given life to his son. If, therefore, he be more than once saved from peril by his son, he can receive a greater benefit than he gave. A benefit becomes greater to the receiver in proportion to his need of it. Now he who is alive needs life more than he who has not been born, seeing that such a one can have no need at all. Consequently, 
a father, if his life is saved by his son, receives a greater benefit than his son received from him by being born. It is said, the benefits conferred by fathers cannot be outdone by those returned by their sons. Why? Because the son received life from his father, and had he not received it, he could not have returned any benefits at all. A father has this in common with all those who have given any men their lives. It is impossible that these men could repay the debt if they had not received their life. Then I suppose one cannot overpay one's debt to a physician, for a physician gives life as well as a father, or to a sailor who has saved us when shipwrecked. Yet the benefits bestowed by these and by all others who give us life in whatever fashion can be outdone. Consequently, those of our fathers can be outdone. If any one bestows upon me a benefit which requires the help of benefits from many other persons, whereas I give him what requires no one to help out, I have given more than I have received. Now a father gave to his son a life which, without many accessories to preserve it, would perish, whereas a son, if he gives life to his father, gives him a life which requires no assistance to make it lasting. Therefore, the father who receives life from his son receives a greater benefit than he himself bestowed upon his son. Chapter 36 These considerations do not destroy the respect due to parents or make their children behave worse to them, nay, better. For virtue is naturally ambitious and wishes to outstrip those who are before it. Filial piety will be all the more eager if in returning a father's benefits it can hope to outdo them. Nor will this be against the will or the pleasure of the father, since in many contests it is to our advantage to be outdone. How does this contest become so desirable? How comes it to be such happiness to parents that they should confess themselves outdone by the benefits bestowed by their children? Unless we decide the matter thus, we give children an excuse and make them less eager to repay their debt, whereas we ought to spur them on, saying, Noble youths, give your attention to this. You are invited to contend in an honourable strife between parents and children, as to which party has received more than it has given. Your fathers have not necessarily won the day because they are first in the field. Only take courage as befits you, and do not give up the contest. You will conquer if you wish to do so. In this honourable warfare, you will have no lack of leaders who will encourage you to perform deeds like their own, and bid you follow in their footsteps upon a path by which victory has often before now been won over parents. Chapter 37 Aeneas conquered his father in well-doing, for he himself has been but a light and a safe burden for him when he was a child. Yet he bore his father, when heavy with age, through the midst of the enemy's lines and the crash of the city which was falling around him, albeit the devout old man, who bore the sacred images and the household gods in his hands, pressed him with more than his own weight. Nevertheless, what cannot filial piety accomplish? Aeneas bore him safe through the blazing city and placed him in safety to be worshipped as one of the founders of the Roman Empire. Those Sicilian youths outdid their parents whom they bore away safe when Atna, roused to unusual fury, poured fire over cities and fields throughout a great part of the island. It is believed that the fires parted and the flames retired on either side so as to leave a passage for these youths to pass through, who certainly deserved to perform their daring task in safety. Antigonus outdid his father when, after having conquered the enemy in a great battle, he transferred the fruits of it to him, and handed over to him the empire of Cyprus. This is true kingship, to choose not to be a king when you might. Manlius conquered his father, Imperius, footnote, there is an allusion to the surname of both the father and the son, Imperiosus, given them on account of their severity, though he was, when in spite of having previously been banished for a time by his father on account of his dullness and stupidity as a boy, he came to an interview which he demanded with the tribune of the people who had filed an action against his father. The tribune had granted him the interview, hoping he would betray his hated father 
and believed that he had earned the gratitude of the youth, having, among other matters, reproached old Manilus with sending him into exile, treating it as a very serious accusation. But the youth, having caught him alone, drew a sword which he had hidden in his robe and said, Unless you swear to give up your suit against my father, I will run you through with this sword. It is in your power to decide how my father shall be freed from his prosecutor. The tribune swore and kept his oath. He related the reason of his abandonment on his action to assembly at the rostra. No other man was ever permitted to put down a tribune with impugny. Chapter 38 there are instances without number of men who have saved their parents from danger, have raised them from the lowest to the highest station, and taken them from the nameless mass of the lower classes, have given them a name glorious throughout all ages. By no force of words, by no power of genius, can one rightly express how desirable, how admirable, how never to be erased from human memory it is to be able to say, I obeyed my parents. I gave way to them. I was submissive to their authority, whether it was just or unjust and harsh. The only point in which I resisted them was not to be conquered by them in benefits. Continue this struggle, I beg of you, even though weary, yet reform your ranks. Happy are they who conquer. Happy are they who are conquered. What can be more glorious than the youth who can say to himself, it would not be right to say it to another, I have conquered my father with benefits. What is more fortunate than that old man who declares everywhere to everyone that he has been conquered in benefits by his son? What again is more blissful than to be overcome in such a contest? Recording by Diana Vandervis, Winnipeg, Canada. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 